Hola, connoisseurs of cage fighting. This is Kid Nate of BloodyElbow.com, joined by our own Dallas Winston. We're going to preview the Ultimate Fighter 16 finale and the UFC on FX6, a.k.a. the Tough Smashes finale. The Tough Smashes finale airs on Friday. The Ultimate Fighter 16 finale airs on FX on Saturday. We're going to talk about Tough Smashes first, but first... Remember to subscribe to MMA Nation on YouTube and get all these videos. Sometimes as we shoot them live, uh, and then uh, uh, generally it'll, you'll get them first before they're posted on Bloody Elbow or MMA Mania or anywhere else. And give this video a like if you like it. How are you doing today, Dallas? You got your pussy problems under control? Yeah, is that under Bentley control. I see, I, is, is that Bentley I see right there? Well, it's good. it's good you're getting to know the fam. This is Scooby. Scooby, yep. I see. So AKA. did you name... The Scuba Dean, a.k.a. Detective Oswald Scooby. He's pretty fashionably decked out today, too. Pretty styling. Is is a Bentley <laughs> named after John Jones's car? No. Oh. She, she predates that by quite a bit. As the, the, uh, see. the car, yes. though, kind of, I guess. Well, let's let's get to the fights. People, people are not paying money, but coming to YouTube to watch some commercials, to listen to us, hear talk us hear us talk about fights. So we're going to talk about the UFC on FX6, Soteropolis versus Pearson. This is the grand finale of the Tough Smashes, which was the UFC's reality show, The Ultimate oh, Fighter, asshole. making its Australian debut with a team of Brits coached by Ross Pearson against a team of Aussies coached by George Soteropoulos. It's a parody of the, uh, the Ashes, which is apparently, I believe, a cricket uh, rivalry between the two countries, not something we Americans know or care about. So the prelim cards, we've got three fights featuring fighters from the Ultimate Fighter series that we don't even know or care about, and I doubt anyone else does either. We'll find out about them. We'll see them on uh, Fuel TV on Friday, and if any of them are good, hey, we'll come back and we'll talk about that at the time. But there's three fights on the Fuel TV preliminary card we do want to talk about. First up, we got Welterweight's Mike Pierce versus Seth Bozinski. What do you think about this one, Dallas? It's a battle between two classic American wrestler-based fighters. Um, I really like the fight. I'm really probably out of all the prelims, uh, maybe between both cards, I'm most intrigued by this fight, really. Um, Pierce used to be like the classic, the most underrated guy around, but I think he's getting a lot of it, a lot of more recognition and attention now, which is long overdue. I think he deserves it. Um, and Bazinski actually is kind of another guy that it, I think is just deceivingly good. Um, it was a little, I don't want to say strange, but, you know, he lost to Tavares by soccer kick on the show, rematched him in the finale, and lost a decision. Wasn't, I don't remember it that well, but, I mean, he wasn't embarrassed by any means. And he got yeah, it was the, a unanimous decision, but it was, a, yeah. it was a close fight. And he got the boot after that and uh, basically kept winning, and now he's got a really nice role going for him. He's a really, really tall and rangy guy. It's inter They're both wrestlers. I wouldn't call them traditional American wrestlers because Pierce is a clinch monster. You know, He just wants body lock and underhooks, and then he'll just grind away. I mean, just like a killer, killer infighter, elbows, short-range knees, durable as hell. I mean, probably one of the most durable guys around. Um so he's the wide-bodied 170, and Bazinski's a really tall guy, long reach, 6'3", lanky, and um, I don't think either of them are real, like, polished or, like, have a lot of finesse from the fringe. They both pretty much just look to get in close and annihilate from there. And it'll be interesting because Bazinski is deadly with the tie plum and single and double, co double collar tie, where Pierce mostly goes, if anything, single collar tie, but he's more down, like, attacking you know, waist and hips level, and the kind of the interesting interplay I see there is that every time Bazinski tries to go high, Pierce will use that control lower down on his body and I assume threaten to take him down. Yeah, it's a classic matchup because Pierce is short and squatty and he's going to be looking for those single legs uh, in the clinch, but that opens up him up exactly to Bazinski's strength, which is which is grabbing the head and, and getting control of the collar and firing knees up into the face. At the same time, if he lifts those legs, Pierce is going to be looking to pick him up and put him on his back. So their their strengths are perfect complements for each other. And I predict somebody's going to get either either Pierce is going to get kneed in the face and dropped, or he's going to put Bazinski on his back and beat him up from there. I don't expect much from Bazinski in his guard or off his back. Do you, do you think he can do anything if Pierce gets him down? It, well, that's going to be his worst-case scenario. He's surprisingly crafty, 
uh, that's another reason why I said he does, he's not like a traditional wrestler. He's not a fish out of water at all on his back, and he's got some submission grappling tendencies, you know, pretty good guillotine and decent submission skills. Um, and I was going to conclude with exactly what you said. Every time Pierce tries to go low and threaten with that takedown, it's going to play right, in, right into Bazinski strikes. Not only his knees, but he's got a real nice over-the-top uh, elbow. So I actually envision the same thing as you, either a knee or an elbow, you know, connecting on Pierce. And I see that as pretty equal, but the big difference being if Bazinski lands one of those, it's, it's a strike, you know, sure, it can do damage. It's not likely to end the fight, but if Pierce puts Bazinski on his back, I mean, that's going to you know, be just way, it's going to play out way huger in his favor than if Bazinski lands even a solid shot, especially considering Pierce's durability. So I really like the fight. I'm going to go with Pierce by decision, but I think Bazinski's a super live dog here for sure. Cool. I think I'm going to make it interesting and go with Bazinski just because I see those knees going into <coughs> Pierce's face. It, it could be a mistake. I just, I think the thing to mention about Pierce's resume is those three really impressive losses to John Fitz, Johnny Hendricks, and Josh Koscheck. All three of those split decisions. Well, Fitz won a unanimous decision, but Pierce clearly won the third round. The other cases were split decisions. I think Pierce has shown he can hang with the top of the, de the division, uh, but can't quite win. And I think Brzezinski might be something a little special. Uh, I think he's, he's a little goofy as an X-Factor. He's not just your usual wrestler like you say, and I think I think he might give Pierce fits, but this is going to be the test, and we'll see. Let's move on to a light heavyweight clash between Igor Pokryak. Dig how well I pronounced that, i gotta, I got to say. I did nice. not say poke nice. Jack like I normally would. Igor Pokryak versus Joey Beltran. Joey Beltran, longtime heavyweight, basically known as the new cabbage. This is a guy who can take a beating without falling down, and Pokryak is a Croatian um, who, uh, you know, they've they've tried to make some crow cop uh, comparisons. I don't think he's any any crow cop. He re reminds me more of Stipe Miocic than than Mirko crow cop. But who you got in this one? Uh, I think I'm going to go with Pokryak. And to be honest, it's one where I don't want to underrate Beltran, but I don't. Uh, you know, he's he had quick hands for a heavyweight, and to me that was his strength. Not a whole lot of power, but. He'd really unreal his hands quickly and, and furiously. And he is another fighter that I don't think the drop made a lot of sense to him because if with that speed being a big advantage. Oh, did I lose you, Dallas? Did you freeze on me? Yeah, I, I, I think Beltran is one of those guys who had to move divisions to uh, uh, stay alive in his career. He'd lost two fights in a row at heavyweight, knocked out by LeVar Johnson, lost a decision to Stipe Miocic, really had no choice but to drop uh, drop weight classes, win a fight outside the UFC, and then he got brought back because they're always looking for bodies to, to put in the cage. But he uh, lost a unanimous decision to James Tahuna at uh, the UFC on Fuel Show in July, and I don't know. I, I'm not expecting him to do very much against Pokrachek, Pokryak. Excuse me, I'm backsliding. You back with me, Dallas, or have we still lost you? Oh, we've lost Dallas. We might have to uh, stop the broadcast and try again. Uh, if you're watching this live, we'll be back in a couple minutes. We'll give this another shot. Oh, there's Dallas. Hi. Back. All right, Hi. Dallas is back. I almost shut the broadcast down, but now we don't have to. Of course, we've got the ghost of Dallas Winston hanging out with us as well. Can you see the yes, it's creepy. of uh, uh, creepy faces there? Anyway, so I was I was filling in, telling people that Beltran basically had no choice but to cut down uh, to light heavyweight because he lost two fights at heavyweight in a row in the UFC, and this is on top of losing two previous fights at heavyweight. So he'd had four losses at heavyweight. It was clear he wasn't going anywhere in the division. He had to get out of there. Uh, win some fights, won something that uh, beat Anton Talamante by decision at something called C3 Fights in April. Came back, fought James DeHuna at the UFC in July and lost. So you going with Prokryak here? Yeah, for sure. In, in from Based exactly on what you just said, because I think the move to light heavyweight was like, uh, well, shit, I don't have anything, you know. I don't have <laughs> have another choice. And not to go off on too, too much of a tangent, we're going to try not to do that in this episode, kids, but I don't like that mentality that a guy has to advance as a contender, otherwise, like, get rid of him. You know, Beltran's a guy, he, he should hang around. I don't think gatekeeper's a negative connotation at all. He'd be a good gatekeeper. He's a good litmus test for any guys coming in. And frankly, I don't give a shit that he lost to the upper end of the heavyweight division. And I don't like to cut the light heavyweight for him. I don't think it's going to pay dividends. And, yeah, I think Pokryak's going to take it to him. I don't know if he can finish him, but either I that or a decision. 
I think that's the question. I'd be pretty astonished, frankly, if Procryak finished Beltran. We haven't really seen killer power out of Procryak, and Beltran uh, has a head made of bricks. It's one of those things, though. I like Beltran. I like seeing him fight, but I don't want to see him uh, incur brain damage, uh, you know, on my TV. I just, or not excessive amounts of brain damage. I know every time he gets in the <laughs> just, cage, he's maybe he's just a little brain damage would be okay. Yeah, a reasonable amount of brain damage <laughs> yeah. is all is all uh, we're asking. But uh, we we agree about that one. Let's go to featherweight. Chad Mendez, a former a title contender, is fighting Yeltsin Meza. I have no idea how to say that. What do you know about these guys? I mean, Chad Mendez, obviously a, a dominant wrestler out of Team Alpha Male. What's Yautzen got for him? He's a sports lab guy with with Ben Henderson, and um, you know, not a not a horrible guy to bring in at all. Um, he's got a, a few suspect losses in the past, but he you know he put together a pretty pretty decent streak coming in. But I mean, if you're gonna fight. You know Chad fucking Mendez. You, I mean, especially for a UFC debutant, you got to be a you know a big swinging dick. And I don't see any reason to you know give him kid Nate status like that so far yet. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I think everyone agrees. I would be shocked if if Mendez doesn't just truck this guy pretty quick. And of course, that's no offense to him. Mendez is an animal. You know, one of the best. And he's legit now. You know, he's not just a real. Uh, a real burly athlete who's going to do back flip guard or front flip guard passes and everything. I mean, he's turned into a, a pretty well polished and rounded mixed martial artist. So, uh, Mendez destruction. Yeah, I mean, and uh, Meza has it going against him that he's a last minute substitute for Hakran Diaz as well. So, so yeah, I, I think the only question is whether or not Mendez finishes this fight in the first round because I think he's really going to be trying to get a finish. I think he's a fighter who's uh, working on. Uh, expunging the reputation of lay and prey and decisions from his resume, and is going to be looking to put on a show here. All right, let's move up to the main card that's going on at FX. First up, we got a middleweight fight between a man uh, who's a former Bellator champion, somebody that was expected to make big waves in the UFC, and came out and disappointed against Tim Boach in his UFC on Fox debut. What do you think? Hector Lombard versus Hausamar Palhares, uh, the tree stump, Toquino. This guy, uh, a lot of juice. Uh, in the octagon. I'm not saying anybody's on uh, performance-enhancing drugs. I'm just saying these guys are well-muscled and well-stacked. What do you think? That they are. And um, my quick little diatribe would be, I, I, I thought it was pretty lame how everyone got all pissy about Lombard. I mean, yeah, I mean, when a guy comes in and, you know, 25-fight win streak and, you know, smokes people, and not chump competition either. You know, a lot of former UFCers, I mean, he's legit. There's no question. He's not like a... A guy who's only been fighting no names, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So he pretty much came in and, yeah, I was a little underwhelmed just because he was so complacent and normally he's a killer. So I think that stark contrast was what pissed everybody off. But at the end of the day, he came in and fought. I think people are doing a disservice to Tim Boach by clowning on Lombard that bad. Boach is the number, you know, whatever you want to call him, four, five, six, middleweight in the world, top contender, huge dude, tough to finish. And to me, it was kind of like the Pierce fights where... Actually, I scored that fight for Lombard. I was surprised there wasn't more of an outcry I, I, over I that. I scored that fight for Lombard, too. I think there was just a disconnect between people's expectations of a quick knockout and what they got, which was a pretty methodical uh, distance fight with some scoring but no real damage done. I thought Lombard did enough to win, but uh, the judges disagreed, and, and Lombard had to go back to the reset button. And here he is on the FX card uh, in Australia. Um, overall, I mean, it's hard to call Paul Harris a, a one-trick pony because even though he's a submission guy, his sub, you know within that realm he's so unbelievably dynamic and diverse. It opens up a lot more doors for him. And on top of that, his striking's been getting a little better. You know, he dropped Danny Miller with that high kick, and so he's a force. I mean, he's always the kind of guy you need to, you know, obviously you know pay attention to and not not underrate whatsoever. I think. Um, Lombard should have a really good package to shut shut down all of his strengths. I mean, he's a he's a black belt himself in BJJ. He's you know equally strong and wide and low center of gravity. Um, I see this as a really bad matchup for for uh, Paul Harris. And I think I hate to say it because uh, I don't know I, I like Paul Harris and Bustamante and the BTT clan, but uh, I think we uh, Paul Harris might get finished here. 
It's entirely possible. I think one thing you didn't mention from Paul Harris's resume, though, that this guy's a really good wrestler. He's got some good slams, some vicious double leg takedowns. He's got a, a nasty high crotch lift. I just don't see any of that working on Lombard. Lombard, a former Olympic judoka with the Cuban team, uh, big strong cat. He he can handle the standing wrestling game uh, as well as anybody in MMA today. I think uh, maybe short of John Jones, but anybody in the division for sure. And when it comes to fisticuffs, I just think Lombard's got the speed and power uh, edge on Palhares. The X factor, of course, will be the heel hooks and the leg attacks of Palhares. But Alan Belcher certainly showed uh, how to decode that in, the, in, the, in Palhares' last fight and really uh, did some stuff with the 50-50 guard that just uh, completely stymied Palhares. And, and so I was pretty shocked. So I, I, I too, am going to go with Lombard. And by knockout, I, I just think if he's on his game, if his sternum isn't broken, which is his story after the Butch fight, that he fought Tim Butch with a broken sternum, which oh. is not on my bucket list of things to do in my life, um, you know, and, and, and he still won. So what if you believe that or not, I don't know. And, and, you know, that begs some questions about what was he doing that he broke his sternum and what kind of shape his ligaments are in, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. And uh, the UFC will be drug testing these fighters uh, for this occasion, so we'll see if there's been any hijinks that will surely be brought to light. All right, up next we've got the Ultimate Fighter Contest, a part of it. We've got the lightweight finals, Britt Colin Fletcher against Britt Norman Park. Who you got in this one? You know, I'm not even going to – I did this with the dissection. It was one of the first times I've ever – usually I can keep up with anything, and I'm not afraid to pull an all-nighter here and there, but um, – my personal schedule has been swamped, and I didn't even have time to do enough research to try to come up with an intelligent, half-assed guess on this one. So this one's all you. Fans, I well, hope you appreciate my honesty because I'm an excellent bullshitter, but I'm not even going to give it a try here. Well, we got to apply your honesty, Dallas. The, i got to admit, I, I only, I'm only up on this fight to the extent that I am because Zombie Prophet found all of the Tough Smashes episodes and put them together in a playlist we posted on Bloody Elbow yesterday, so I watched the last two episodes and watched the fights, the semifinal fights from the tournament. Basically, Park looks like a lay-and-pray wrestler guy, which is unusual for a Brit, uh, but Fletcher's really big, and I think I think that's... Uh, he's uh, He didn't do anything else to really impress me, but he's a lot bigger than Park, and I don't think Park's going to be able to hold him down for a decision, which seems to be his only option. So I'm going to go by Fletch with Fletcher uh, by TKO, I think. And then the other the other uh, tough finale is uh, Aussie Robert Whitaker against Britt Brad Scott. And in this one, um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take the call myself. I think that uh, Whitaker, uh, just based on they have a common opponent in Xavier Lucas in the, in the show, and Scott struggled with the guy, so I'm going to use some MMA math and say, you know, Whitaker breeze past the common opponent and I think he's just got the power I think he's going to knock out Scott so we'll see hopefully those fights will be entertaining everybody will know more about these guys after we see him fight on FX now let's get to the finale George Sotiropoulos the Aussie coach against Ross Pearson the Brit now Pearson's been playing around with his weight classes he's been dropping down to featherweight and now he's back up to lightweight what do you think who you got in this fight well Pearson is the guy that I used before as a kind of like I did with Beltran is uh, just didn't seem like a sensible drop for him he doesn't use his strength and power and size whatsoever. He uses his speed. I mean, he's a quick boxer. That's his shtick. So I wasn't surprised that he didn't fare well at, at featherweight. I'm glad to see him back as a lightweight. Um, I know people are a little down on Barboza now because, uh, you know, of that recent loss to Varner. But, I mean, Pearson went, you know, tit for tat with Barbosa when Barbosa was supposedly an unstoppable, you know, phenom and the next big thing. So I think Pearson is a, is a gamer for sure. Um, I really like uh, his close range, bo close range boxing and the angles he uses. You know, he'll throw in a lot of like angle jabs, and he's really tricky with the trajectories and the angles he hits for his punches, but and with his head and with his footwork too. Um, obviously, Sotoropoulos is going to have a big submission grappling advantage here. Um, I'm not quite sure he's going to be able to implement it. You know, he's another guy with great subs, but not necessarily a real traditional wrestling background. Um, short of a long story, I can see it going either way. I have a lot of respect for both guys, but I'm going to go with Pearson in this one by a decision. Yeah, I kind of have to concur there. Sotiropoulos is a guy who is riding, what, a 6-7 fight win streak in the UFC, beat Joe Lozon, Joe Stevenson, Kurt Pellegrino, uh, George Roop, a number of guys, but then he ran up into a brick wall named Dennis Seaver and just got shut down at UFC 127 and uh, couldn't implement his ground game whatsoever. And then Rafael Dos Anjos knocked him out at 
UFC 132. And I think that Pearson's going to keep Soteropoulos' bad luck streak going. I think Pearson uh, has the good enough wrestling defense to, to stay on his feet and is just going to pick him apart uh, on the on the feet with the boxing. I don't think he's going to get a knockout, but I do think he'll do enough to take home a decision. Well, let's switch to the Saturday card, the, the Ultimate Fighter 16 finale. The first three fights are on Facebook. Um, looks like just a bunch of tough guys. I, I have not watched this season very closely. I only watched the last episode or two and just, just the fights. Uh, any of those flights on the Facebook card you're interested in or think are notable? Uh, hold on, I'm spooling that up right now. We got Jared Papazian against Tim Elliott, the flyweight, which is the only fight I'm at all interested oh, in. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, Ruben Duran, I'm kind of interested to see him come back. He's the guy that uh, kind of had a comeback rear naked choke on Francisco Rivera. Um, Elliott and Papazian's halfway. halfway interesting. I think um, Elliott was really tough against Dodson in... Um, in his premiere, um, so I kind of like him to, to win that one because Papazian's been real shaky. You know, he looked real good against Easton, but and I was shocked, man. He got you know tapped with the quickness by uh, uh, Dustin Pegg. So uh, I'm definitely leaning Duran over Viana, uh, even though Viana might be interesting. He's dropping down and he's kind of a frenetic berserker type guy from tough Brazil so I'm fairly interested in that but um, unless you have any thoughts on that yeah I'm, I'm digging the uh, the fuel pre uh, the fuel TV prelims are pretty solid for this yeah let's move on up to, to the fuel TV card uh, TJ Waldberger against Nick Catone at welterweight what do you think about this one Catone uh, was a middleweight before and beastly middleweight you know I mean he was a big ass burly middleweight really good wrestler uh, at middleweight, and f I, I'm shocked that he's able to squeeze that frame down into you know 170 pound proportions. Um, he's a decent striker, but kind of the key with him is he's a brown belt in jujitsu as well. I don't, you know, that's a tough thing to assess nowadays. Belt color doesn't really mean shit as far as how a guy's going to perform on the floor in MMA. But man, if he can maintain the same, I guess, physical exuberance, you know, the, you know, his agility that he had at middleweight and that same strength with his game plan, man, this guy could be a monster at welterweight. Yeah, but this is his first time uh, fighting at welterweight. His last fight was a 195-pound catchweight uh, bout, and so until he makes weight, I'm going to withhold judgment on that. I just, I just have no idea what Nick Catone is going to look like uh, weighing in at 170. I know he's not going to be fighting at 170, but he's going to have to weigh in at 170 the day before the fights, and until he does it, uh, and then we see, you know, is he going to look like Rich Franklin? Is he going to come in all emaciated and, and drawn and, and uh, dehydrated? Or is he, is he uh, going to look like he's made a sensible uh, weight shift in weight classes by losing some muscle weight and, and not relying on a huge Anthony Johnson-style water weight cut? So we'll just have to see on that one. Wahlberger, uh, that loss to Brian Eversole uh, in just an ugly fight really <sighs> – took the yeah. wind out of Wahlberger's sails, I have to say. That was that was just a crappy fight from both guys. Uh, and, um, you know, he, he had two wins in a row going. Uh, before that, he got uh, knocked out by Johnny Hendricks. I don't know. I'm going to go with Catone uh, with some reservations just because until I see him make the weight cut, I don't know. But what do you think? Who are you picking? The questions surrounding his weight cut and everything are what's going to steer me towards Wahlberger. Um it's. I mean, obviously on the ground, I think he's black belt and beyond because he's so creative. You never know, you know, kind of like Paul Harris to a certain extent. He's so dynamic with the submissions. He has an, an ability to just, you know, I guess enforce them, uh, you know, on a, to an unbelievable extent. So um, I'm going to take Waldberger, but really like the Ebersol fight, I mean, Katone should be able to replicate that very easily. Wahlberger's kind of a, I don't know, I was going to say sloppy striker, but it works for him. They're distraction strikes. He'll fling out enough to, to keep you occupied. And he's kind of like Sotoropoulos, not a, a real gifted or decorated wrestler, but, you know, still has, you know, a lot of tricks of the trade and can find a way to do it. Um, so I'm going to go Wahlberger, but man, if Katona's is in good shape, he's going to be monstrous at that weight class, and he could easily keep him up on the feet and stuff all his takedowns. Yeah, I could, I could see Katona just putting a beating on Wahlberger, but it all comes down to you know what's Katona going to look like at welterweight. Up next, we got a lightweight fight between Vint Pichel and Rustam Kabalov, a Russian. You know anything about either of these cats? Yeah, uh, Pichel was on uh, Tough Live. And uh, I took note of him because he was good. Um, he's got he's seven and zero. I mean, just flattened the fuck out of everyone by knockout. So, I mean, ridiculously heavy hands. But 
what started to attract my attention was um, he won his first two fights on the show by submission to get into the house. One was an arm triangle, so it's not like you know some guy fell into a guillotine or whatever. Uh, he ended up losing his, a decision to Ally Aquinta, but uh, it, it's kind of like the Lombard thing. It wasn't huge, like this big you know disaster or anything, but I thought the first round was close, but I gave it to Pichel over Iaquinta, but um, Iaquinta won the second, and the judges, you know, there was no third round, they gave it to him, so I think he's another lurking talent, he could be, uh, you know, a, a serious, I don't know, a, a force as far as a tough guy goes, um, Kabalov is like another in the endless run of uh, combat sambo, uh, Russian world champions that we're seeing come in, he trains out of Greg Jackson's, uh, one loss, came up in M1, I think... Uh, you know, all the all of the people before him, the combat sambo champs, have proven that that's a really solid, you know, background to walk into the UFC with. So, uh, past level of competition, I put about even. I I think this is a bit of a coin flip. Uh, I think Pichel could end it. He could definitely end it at any time. Who knows if he's going to? Um, Kabalov's a bit of a safer pick just for his diversity, but it definitely watch Pichel in this one, and he might have a future, at least a couple more fights in the UFC. Yeah, I, I like what I've seen from Pichel. Uh, it's kind of frustrating that he didn't get on the tough finale for Tough Live. And Kabbalah, the thing with those combat sambo guys, until you've seen them in the cage against a UFC fighter who did the weight cutting, you just can't tell. Sometimes these Russian guys are Fedor or Igor, and sometimes they're not. And so until I've seen him tie up uh, with an American fighter in the octagon and seen whether or not he's big enough, strong enough to be fighting at lightweight in the UFC, uh, will, I, will I, you know, make a pick on him? Um, it's an X factor. Again, there's a lot of unknown variables here. I'm going to go with Pichel, but, but Kabbalah could easily uh, control position, work some submissions, uh, some ground and pound. Uh, combat Sambo is a very effective style, so, so we'll find out. It's going to be fun. He's a lot more experienced, too, not only in Combat Sambo, but he's got, I think, twice the fights of Pichel. Um so I'm kind of interested to see how this goes. And I'm not sure, even though Pichel was on tough and he fought, you know, so he's got a little bit of that UFC experience, but I don't know if I would put Kabalov in as over his head because really Pichel hasn't done that against the standard run-of-the-mill UFC guys either, showed up, fought, and proved he can compete at that level. So Very, very true. Who very knows? True. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is a lot of unknowns here. So up next we've got Bantamweight's Johnny Bedford and Marcos Vicinius uh, from the Brazilian Ultimate Fighter. Who you got in this one? Um, I kind of like Bedford. Uh, Vinicius is, you know, he could definitely, he, he's, he'll, I expect him to be in this fight, or at least competitive. Bedford is a, is, is a really big bantamweight. You know, five foot ten for a bantamweight is hefty. And, I mean, he laid that big brother beating on Lewis Godno to the, you know, that was one of those, one of the few where I know even the hardcore fans were cringing a little bit, going, oh, all right, you know, that's, he, the homeboys had about enough here. So I'm going to lean with Bedford here, but I'm kind of interested to see what Vinicius can bring here. I wouldn't rule him out, but I'm going to lean Bedford. Yeah, I got I to gotta second that emotion. I, I, I got to go with Bedford here. And then we got Welterweight's Mike Pyle and James Head rounding up the Fuel TV card. Who you got in this one? I'm going to go with James Head in this one. I don't know if that's going to be a big outcry. Is it? Uh, it is with me. I mean, Mike Pyle is right. looking rejuvenated and, and very well-rounded, very formidable, very clever fighter. I'm interested to see your logic here. Well, Head, I'm surprised. That, talk. I mean, I was shocked at how huge he was for a welterweight. And it's not necessarily that he's just extremely tall or just big and burly. He's just, I mean, he looks to be a full size above, really well-proportioned, just, um, you know, I mean, bigger, stronger, thicker, taller, and before I was a little worried. He's a he's he's a traditional boxer. You know, a lot of guys claim boxing, but he has definitely more of a a distinctly traditional style to his boxing. And he's a little bit I don't know if I want to say a phenom, but he's excelled quickly under Lovato in in jujitsu. I think he's only a purple now, but um, the one question mark was wrestling. And I think man, I think it was because of the weight cut. But the way I mean, he shut Ebersol down. Solidly, I think I want to say Ebersol hit like one takedown out of fifteen, and Ebersol was way better. coming in on on short notice and and had and been he looks messing small. around with his weight cut and, and and different things like that. So I, he, I I didn't see I didn't consider that as Ebersol at his best. I didn't either. He looked scrawny, didn't he? Wasn't that weird? Well, seeing... he had been trying to cut down the lightweight when they when they gave him that the fight on very short notice. I think within fifteen days of his previous fight. So yeah. 
you know, it just wasn't indicative. So I don't know. For me, I'm going to go with Pyle just because he's a safe bet. He's a savvy veteran. This uh, very well rounded. If if Head has any gaps in his wrestling game, Pyle is going to put him on his back and 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 exploit that with a good ground and pound, a good submission game. So I'm going to go with Pyle, but I'm very curious to see how Head does. And 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 definitely your pick has got me uh, reconsidering mine. Let's well, move to the main. Before you go on, let me yeah. juice it up a little bit. I think Head's going to knock him out. Um, the guys pile loses to our our power strikers who can stuff his takedowns, and that's exactly what I expect to happen. I like Head's boxing because he's got excellent precision and power, but he's really methodically smart about it. You know, he never just you know freaks out and lets his hands go and leaves himself open. He's just going to slowly chip away and chip away. So um, I don't think Pyle can take him down. I don't think he can survive long with him on the feet. Second round knockout. Wow, bold words. Well, we'll see what happens uh, on Saturday. So now we're going to move to the main FX card. We've got the featherweights, Dustin Poirier and Jonathan Brookins. Who are you liking this one? Um, now we're getting to the ones that I haven't done the dissections for yet, so I'm going to do these on the fly. Um, I, d I definitely like Poirier for sure. Um, I think he's a real tough dude. Um, I was not really sure about him as he was coming up because he didn't rise into that contender slot by beating a lot of huge names. Um, Brookins is a great guy. You know, I like him as a person. Uh, respect his his heart and his determination. But man, I mean, he has got to clean up that striking if he's going to hang around. You know what I mean? And I don't. You know, I always hate to say you know really rude things, but I mean, the way he leaves his chin exposed. I mean, he he can't survive if he doesn't do something about that quick. And Poirier is the type of guy he's well rounded enough where Brookins is fairly. I don't want to say one-dimensional wrestling and submissions, but if he doesn't get that wrestling part down, his submissions won't come in. So in a way, that's kind of one-dimensional, and I think Poirier's, or Poirier is going to not let him you know, play that game. Yeah, uh, if you remember the beating that uh, Poirier put on Josh Grisby at UFC 125 in his UFC debut, I think that's where he really got a lot of people's attention. I think until his submission loss to the Korean Zombie in his last fight, the guy was looking like a title contender. So I think Brookins is a tough test. I think he's one that Poirier is going to pass. I expect Poirier to finish him. Uh, I do too. Uh, probably in the second round. All right. So lightweights, Melvin Guillard and Jamie Varner. This, these are two guys fighting for redemption here. Melvin, of course, has been up and down more than any other fighter. He's had more uh, aborted title runs than anybody I can think of in the lightweight division in the past seven years. And Jamie Varner, a former WEC champ, who fell on hard times, had to had to kind of squeeze his way in uh, to the UFC by taking uh, uh, Barbosa, Edson Barbosa, on on short notice, and then punking him, and then and then he lost his next fight to Joe Lozon. So uh, Jamie, the Warren Varner, and Melvin, the young assassin of the yard, both have a lot on the line here. Who do you think is going to redeem themselves? Well, I'm kind of smiling a little bit because to me, like the those two performances from Varner are kind of like what MMA is all about. Both, you know, giving no, you know, given no chance, short notice. You know, people were just, you know, really high, I'll say, on Barboza. And I understand that, but, and I didn't I, I didn't pick Varner to, to win that one either. So I was surprised, but I was glad to see Jamie do it. He's a good guy. He's a hard worker. But I was really even more impressed with his loss to Lo, uh, Joe Lozon, which I thought was, I mean, just gutsy. I mean, he had to dig real, real deep for that one. Um, I mean, everyone knows the scoop with Gallard. I mean, insanely athletic um, just brutally effective kickboxing, you know, not polished, you know, in the ring, pretty, like street fighting technical type shit. So um, I hate to say it, but I think it's going to be a really bad matchup for Varner. Um, you know, Varner is more of like a wrestle submission guy. He's not the kind of guy that's going to, you know, do something real fluid or technical. Uh, you know, he'll he'll pound on you, and if you duck your head while he's shooting a takedown or, you know, at any point in time, he'll latch on a, a top-heavy sub, a guillotine, something like that, a uh, rear naked choke. So I think uh, Melvin's going to be a really bad matchup for him. Too quick, too rangy, uh, and his takedown defense is, is pretty good. He has his lapses, but that's because he digs in and throws heaters. So there's a chance Varner could put him on his back, but, uh, you know, Melvin's still really scrappy with his defensive guard, so... Really bad matchup for Varner, I think. I'll go with Gillard. Uh, that's an entirely reasonable pick, but I just have visions of what Joe Lozon did to, to Melvin running in my head, and I know Varner's seen that fight. Lozon's just one of those guys. He refused to be bullied by Melvin. He came right at him, caught him with a punch, stunned him, immediately followed that up with an attack, got him, uh, got on his back and submitted him, 
And, uh, you know, that's been the book on Melvin ever since Joe Stevens did that to him way back uh, in the day on the headliner on a spike card. So I think Varner's got a shot to do that because he can throw punches, he can wrestle, he can submit. He's a, he's a well-rounded fighter and he's got balls. But I'm going to go with you. I think Melvin's just too much, too fast, uh, too much power in his hands uh, for the worm. Up next, we got heavyweights Pat Berry and Shane Del Rosario. Pat Berry, of course, a long time, uh, basically a journeyman in the UFC. He wins some, he loses some. Shane Del Rosario was an undefeated red hot prospect in Strike Force until a car wreck, an injury from a car wreck, uh, took him out for almost a year. And then he uh, lost badly in his UFC debut. Who you get, debut? Who you got in this one? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm immediately inclined to go with Barry because I just like the guy, and it's a close fight. Um, I'm real uh, excited to see how Del Rosario does now once he can get embedded in the UFC, and we really get to see him go, you know, go through a bunch of trials by fire. Really well-rounded guy, tall, rangy, uh, you know, good grappling, really, you know, solid Muay Thai, uh, cr you know, credentialed Muay Thai fighter. So, um you know, I don't know how this is going to pan out. He's going to have a big reach advantage on Pat, and I think that really flusters him, you know, being such a short guy. Uh, so he's, his quickness, as usual, is going to have to dictate all of this. Um, I'd really like to see him, you know, armchair, you know, quarterback warning here, but Pat uses his quickness, but it's always in and out, in and out, in a straight line, and I'd really like to see him take advantage of that more with some lateral movement and side-to-side -side angles and that kind of thing. Um, because I, I, I think he's going to be too predictable if he just constantly moves in and out. Then he's only working on one, you know, straight line quickness and timing. So a little bit of a fanboy pick here. I'm going to go with Barry, but it's going to be a close one. Four words for you, Dallas. Old dog, new tricks. Pat Barry's not learning any lateral movement. Uh, he's not in a point in his career where he's making huge advances. I'm not sure he's training with these days since Camp Death Clutch shut down. And I think Del Rosario is just tailor-made to beat Pat Barry. I think he's got the kickboxing skills to defend himself and avoid the just brutal leg kicks and punches that Pat Barry can throw. And then from there, I mean, the book on Pat Barry is uh, take him down and submit him. And I think Shane Del Rosario uh, has, has definitely has the skills to do it. The question is just, is this the same Shane Del Rosario that put together that undefeated record? I'm going to go with the optimistic scenario. I hope that he's recovered from all his injuries from his car wreck. He's put all his troubles behind him. He's at his best, and we're going to see him uh, show off against Pat Barry a little bit. That brings us to the finale of the uh, Ultimate Fighter. we got welterweights Colton Smith and Mike Ricci. Ricci's been talking shit about how nightmarish the Ultimate Fighter experience was, how he considered suing the UFC and FX for the, the, the dreadful nightmare of being in a house with a bunch of other jocks for uh, six weeks. What do you make of this one? I like Ricci. Solid, you know, solid, solid fighter. Um... I don't really get involved with a lot of the out of the cage stuff, so I thought it was kind of humorous that you know that he did that. Obviously, you know whatever sixteen or thirty-two guys for the years before you know were able to survive it. But on the other hand, I, I mean he might have a case legally because uh, you know I turned the show on once and it was the the dude with the pink mohawk embodying everything that you try to explain to people MMA is not about. So. On that point, Ricci, you know, I agree with you, and I applaud your your legal efforts. So you take some balls to sue the, you know, have the UFC invite you on a show, and you know, big balls. Uh, but the good thing with Ricci is he's a really, really skilled fighter, well-rounded, uh, technical and tactical, real smart. Colton Smith is pretty much a takedown guy, uh, really good though. I mean, the kind of guy where he's gonna make you stop takedown after takedown religiously, otherwise you're gonna lose. So. Really tough matchup for a lot of people, but I'm going to go with Ricci here, just too diverse. Yeah, I have to second that. I I, I just think Colton Smith's got a very limited toolkit, and I, I don't I think he's got enough to win. Uh, How ironic was it that he was the guy who came out and fake tapped? You know, or, I'm sorry, fake glove touch to hit the takedown? Yeah. You know, yeah, I remember yeah. thinking, man, that cat ended up making it to the finals, but he's a good guy, a good wrestler, but I don't, uh, you know, I don't think he's got enough for Ricci. No, I don't either. And that brings us to the uh, headlining fight, which was supposed to be coaches Roy Nelson and Shane Carwin. Carwin's injuries have continued. The guy has had nothing but bad luck in the last couple of years with back injuries, knee injuries, neck injuries, surgery, surgery, surgery. He's out again. And that gives us Matt Mitrione, an NFL veteran, against Roy Nelson. What do you think about this one? Um, I think this is going to be Nelson as, like, the you know the dad figure. He's been around so much. He's smart. 
Um, you know, Mitrione has unparalleled talent in, ath in athleticism. I mean, for a guy, former NFL player, to be that big and strong but still be that quick and fleet of foot, in his boxing, I mean, everyone was shocked when he came out with that. And but quick of hand. He's got really fast, really good hand speed. Unbelievable. And another really likable guy. You know, I saw a couple of his fights cage side, and to see him literally, you know, as advertised, smiling in the middle of, you know, you know, throwing hands with Joey Beltran and that kind of thing. So I like Mitrione. I would really like to see him um, maximize all that athleticism and natural talent. But I think it might just be a little too late in the game. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. He's got some years ahead. But against big country, I don't think it's going to be enough. I think Mitrione really distinctly gets gun shy when he's facing a guy that he knows will, you know, stuff a fist down his throat if he, you know, slips up in the slightest. So I don't think he's got a real strong routine for how I'm going to – the Czech Congo fight was a perfect example. He just didn't know how to close that distance. And every time he did, you could see he was just visibly – uh, uncomfortable and gun shy, and I mean, you know, Big Roy with that right hand. I mean, is as simple as it is. It's brutally effective. So um, I'd like to see Mitrion maybe put on a good show. It's going to be all about his quickness and size. Um, I mean, he's a better boxer than than Big Country by far. He's quicker. He's more precise. He's got a hell of a reach. He's got all the tools in the world to beat him. But that's happened before with Sutter with Big Bender Country. Shot. You know, yeah, right, right. Dave Herman. I mean, a, a you know, ton of guys. Yeah. yeah, we've seen so many younger, faster, more athletic, stronger uh, heavyweights come in against big country and end up getting clowned. I think I think Mitrione's going to be yet another guy on the receiving end of a right hand. It's not so much that Mitrione's hand speed, blah blah blah. It's just Roy Nelson's savviness. He sees when somebody's making a mistake. He knows when somebody's dropping their hands. He knows how to bait a fighter into dropping their hands and eating that right hand. And I think he's going to serve it up to Matt. On a big fat plate and get a second round KO. That's that's my bold prediction. I'd say he he's probably going to get that. I don't know if he if he can, you know if he can completely turn his lights out. It might be more of a volume attack. I'd be shocked. I mean, big countries. Get, he's one of the most technical from a positional standpoint. One of the most technical submission grapplers around, and we rarely ever see that. So if he does decide to take Mitrion down, it's lights out quickly. Um, yeah. If he if he finishes him with strikes, I think it'll be more a little more volume. Although I mean, who knows? We might just see the big old heat seeker come through. Yeah, you, you never know. Roy's got a lot of weapons, and they could easily submit Mitrion if if he uh, takes it down. I don't think Mitrion has the wrestling to defend himself, and definitely does not have the grappling skills to defend himself against Roy Nelson. We could see Roy employ the crucifix like he did against Kimbo Slice. Well, anyway, I think we've covered the fights. Any final comments you have to make on these events? No, pay me more because I have a shitload of writing to do for the next 14 hours. <laughs> we'll see what we can do, Dallas. All right, thanks, everybody. I want to remind you again to subscribe to MMA Nation on YouTube, and you'll get all our videos. And look out for this on bloodyelbow.com. Thanks, Dallas. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the fights. We'll Bye. see you next time.